is here today. I uh, just want to remind everybody before we continue, before I forget to say anything, that if you've been vaccinated, you can sing without your mask and you do not have to wear your mask. So before we start, we'll get into some announcements. As you guys will look up here on the screen, we have some Bible studies. The men's Bible study is starting at 1900. Food will be served at 1830, so you guys can come and eat before we jump into our Bible study. I am the POC, so if you guys are interested, please get with me afterwards, and I will get you plugged in. On Tuesday, we're going to be going over a three-part series on what is faith. It's going to be, well, the definition of faith is the first one. The second one is justified by faith. It's the reformed doctrine on what it means to be justification by faith alone. And then the third series is going to be where do we get faith? Where does faith come from? Then for the women's Bible study, this starts on Tuesdays at 1830. And Amani Phillips is the POC for that. She goes to the 1300 service. If you guys would like to be plugged in, just reach out to her on Facebook Messenger. She'll get you guys caught up. All right, so that's it for our announcements. So to begin our service today, I will be reading some scriptures for the confession of sin. So for our call to worship, the first scripture I'm going to read is from Romans 3.23, and it is, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the next scripture I'll be reading <coughs> is uh, from 1 John chapter 1, nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please take a moment, pray to God for the cleansing of your heart, to have a pure heart, to worship God in the fullness that we came here today. gather here today to worship you with the fullness of our hearts, that when we pray for confession of sin, Lord, you are trustworthy and you are faithful to wash our hearts and make it clean so we can worship you in a pleasing manner. And Lord, I hope that as we go through our service today, we don't forget Christ, our mediator between us and you, that apart from him and apart from him coming here and dying for our sins, we would have no part with you, but because of him. As it says in your word, we can know you, and to know you is eternal life. In Christ's name, I pray these things to you. Amen.
Romans chapter 6. In this letter to the Romans, Paul explains the gospel and expounds on its teaching. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died in sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. For the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Please take a moment of silence. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for Jesus Christ, for his forgiveness and redemption through him. We ask your blessing this day upon us as we come humbly to worship you. And it's only you, Lord, that we worship. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Please join us in song.
you may be seated. It's time for our offering. If I can have our ushers prepare themselves. And um, uh, Brother Ralph, you can rent the slide for our designated offering. So once a month, and this will be the last one for this um, season. So the uh, African Christian University, it's in Lusaka, Zambia. And so you can see there their vision. The, uh, an excellent place of education to glorify God through training, having a biblical worldview basis, innovative and steward-oriented, and their mission to educate students from the Christian worldview in the contemporary and historic body of truths through classical liberal arts and sciences in all spheres of life and vocations for students to exercise discernment, discipling holistically and equipping with practical skills, and they list their values there. And the uh, chancellor is in the red shirt there on top left. Uh, and so here's a picture of some of the uh, graduates from recent times. So that means that uh, if you are so inclined, anything that you put in the offering plate today will go directly to that university in Zambia as they desire to establish a strong, uh, God-honoring educational institution to produce students who go out not only to Africa, but wherever else they might go, um, and be men and women who are equipped with not only a knowledge of God and his word, but they're ready to serve the Lord and to be good uh, citizens wherever they are. So that's going to be our designated offering. So if I have the ushers come forward and pick up our offering, uh, you can give electronically as well. As well, We have the QR code uh, paper back there. Uh, I think seems like uh, someone tried earlier and it uh, wasn't quite working, so I'll, I'll see if I can get that solved if you want to come later in the week uh, to, uh, to give uh, electronically. Please join me in prayer over the offering. Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to give and to give to a ministry or an educational institution like the one we see here, African Christian University. Lord, they're doing your work and they're spreading salt as in like a preservative and light, the light of your truth in Zambia and throughout Africa. And we're so grateful for that. We're grateful that we have the opportunity to give, to support that school with all those students coming and learning, graduating, and going out to work in whatever capacity, whatever vocation they're in, to make their contribution to society, to be upstanding men and women of integrity, living for you, as well as being a good example in their communities. And so we ask your blessing on that institution. We thank you for the privilege to be able to give. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to transition to sermon time. So if you would take your Bible or your phone, if you don't have your paper copy, and go to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. The first one is Matthew, the first book of the New Testament. Chapter 28 is the last chapter, and uh, baptisms, uh, unfortunately, don't come that often. We're going to have one today in just a little bit, and I wanted to speak on the subject itself and uh, help, help us to just be reminded, reacquainted with uh, what is the reason for it uh, in the context of the Great Commission. So let me read to you, first of all, uh, two, uh, two clips from some documents um, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, written in 1677 but published in 1689, had this to say. So this was a doctrinal paper, <laughs> kind of like a white paper, so to speak. It's a doctrinal confessional statement. It says this, Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ. To those baptized, it is a sign of their fellowship with him in his death and resurrection, of their being engrafted into him, of the forgiveness of sins, and submitting themselves to God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life. 
sounds very much like what Brother Charles was reading earlier out of Romans 6. And then about uh, four years later, one of the early Baptists in England, his name was Benjamin Keach, he wrote a Baptist catechism, which is basically a question and answer format. And so the question, who is the proper recipient of water baptism? Answer, those who do actually profess repentance toward God, faith in and obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, they are the only proper subjects of this ordinance. And so that's just two snapshots from church history um, from the uh, 1600s showing us how these things were put into words for us. And I stand here to say to you that I think they are an accurate representation of what the Bible says of Jesus. So in Matthew, so Jesus, of course, is at the end of his earthly ministry, right? And then by the time we get to Matthew 28, he's already been crucified, buried, and then rose again after the third day, resurrected and alive. He spent a long time, many, a number of weeks, being seen by over 500 people. I'm taking that from Corinthians, which gives that detail. And of course, uh, the goes to the upper room to find his discouraged and sad-looking disciples, the 12. And of course, when he enters the room, they all have their various reactions. And so he gives some final remarks. He gives final words, final charge, final encouragement to them before he ascends. And so he gives what is called the Great Commission. Um, the word commission would be very uh, uh, significant to uh, people in the military, right? There is what's called being commissioned into the military, and it's where you basically receive a charge, you receive an assignment, and you make a pledge to uphold it. And so this is called the Great Commission. So let's start with verse 16, Matthew 28, 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. I can imagine they would. Can you imagine you've been with him for three years? You've lived, you've walked, you've run, you've hidden, you've uh, sweated, you've eaten, you've slept all together as a group, kind of a band of brothers. And they've done this for three years. And then for some of them, because of their doubts, um, when they see him crucified, they go away saying, is, is that it? This is, is it all over? Not really accepting the fact that he had already told them that he would rise again. But then when he does rise again and come back to life like no one ever has and no one ever will, and they're reunited with him, it's one of those awe-inspiring moments. Similar to the moment in which they were all on a ship, if you recall, if you know anything from the Gospels, there was a time uh, before when, when Jesus was on a boat with them, his disciples, and the storm was raging. And they woke Jesus up because he was taking a nap, and he just spoke, and the storm calmed, and the seas calmed, and the storm went away. And if you recall, at that point, Peter, it was all, it was, for all of it was jaw-dropping, but for Peter especially, he said, I can't be near you. I, I just have to, I can't, I have to get away. And he said, and Jesus was like, why? He's like, because I'm such a sinner. Now, you would have expected Peter to say something like, because you're just so awesome. But Peter, it was causing, seeing the glory of Jesus, seeing the majesty of Jesus, seeing the om omnipotent power of of Jesus. On the one hand, he's just a man because he's in bodily form. He's, a, he's taken on humanity. He's just a man. But on the other hand, he, he's far more than that. He's the actual creator of the universe, as the Bible teaches us. So I can imagine there were times when people were like, well, he's just like a guy like one of us. And then he does something miraculous. And you're like, whoa. Then again, I'm reminded. He's far more than that. So at this one occasion, I just remember, Peter was reduced in such humility down. Not because Jesus was pointing his finger and saying, you're such a corrupted man. 
All Jesus did was command nature to obey him, and it did. But that made Peter reflect on his sinfulness, and that's because Peter was seeing just exactly who Jesus was. He was seeing the glory, the power, the majesty, the holiness, the purity, the otherness of Jesus, the transcendentness, because Jesus is God the Son. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And so he was suddenly getting just a glimpse of the transcendent and the otherness, the deity, the divinity of Christ. And that just reduced him down. He said, I'm such a sinner, I don't deserve to be here. So you can imagine in verse 17 when it says, when they saw him, they worshipped him. They probably just were so humbled. They were probably such, in such awe. They just like fell down and said, you just need to be worshipped. So it's interesting to see that. But it also says this, and boy does this tell us about us. In verse 17, comma, but some doubted. Verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So notice that's the prelude. That's like, that's like the statement you make before you're going to say the things you want to say. So before he starts giving four commands, which is in verses 19 and 20, he, notice how he, start, he starts this, this off, right? This will be the equivalent of you walking into the room and people don't really know you, and you have to say, let me tell you who I am so that you'll know that when I get ready to tell you what to do, you're going to know you should do it. So this is what Jesus does. He says, before I tell you, remember this. All authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. That kind of leaves no other room, right? There's no, not much wiggle room to get around that, you know. If he is basically saying, I am the highest authority in existence, <laughs> then what he's going to say next is something we need to listen to and follow. So here he goes into four commands. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The word nations there in the Greek, which is what underlies our English, is ethnos, which we get our word ethnicity from. He's saying, go into all of the ethnicities of the world. Basically, go around the world. Go everywhere. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All authority has been given, and he gives these four imperatives. Go make disciples, baptize, and teach. That is what every church should be doing. This is like the nuts and bolts. This is, the, this is like the, the vision and mission statement. This is exactly what the church should be doing, these things. Going out to all the world, seeing people converted, making disciples of them, baptizing them, and teaching them how to be Christians. That is it in a nutshell. That's what the church should be doing. Some churches don't do this to their shame. Some churches don't maybe do it well. Others are doing it well. And when your time up, when your time is up here, if you're a Christian and your time is up here and you go on to some other place, perhaps the United States, or maybe you go to some other place in the world in your service as uh, service members, you need to make sure you find a church, and if you can't find a church due to circumstances, a chapel, where this kind of thing is being fulfilled to the best of its ability. These four things. Go to all nations. And what strikes us about that is what uh, is said here in, in Romans. Uh, I want to go to Romans 10 because it, it's captured so well here in Romans 10 where uh, Paul is, is speaking about what is, ex what is involved, really, what is involved in, in this idea of going Right? And so in, in Romans 10, I think we have probably one of the best detailed passages uh, of this, if you'd like to look at that with me. So in Romans 10, he says in verse 14, 13, 10, 13, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And notice the series of logical questions that have rhetorical answers. So Paul is using logic, and he's giving a rhetorical question, which means it really impl implies its own answer. How will they call, meaning people, right, out there in the world, how will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord who has believed what, we have, have, what he has heard from us. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So you can't call on someone you have not been able to believe in. You can't believe in someone who you've never heard about. And you cannot hear unless someone tells you or preaches to you. And that person who comes and preaches to you can't do that unless he is sent by someone. So you can see the logic and the rhetoric here. This is why Jesus says, church, go and then make disciples of all ethnicities. And once they become Christians, baptize them. And then the process begins of teaching them and discipling them. But that won't happen unless we go. And that's really what Paul is saying here in this set of rhetorical questions that we just looked at in Scripture. And he ends that with, faith will come by hearing. If you never hear, you can't have faith. Faith comes by hearing and the hearing by the word of Christ. If you don't hear about Christ, you can't have faith. If you can't have faith, you can't be saved. You can't become a Christian. And that's why Jesus is saying, go and go out and make disciples. And make disciples. Disciple just means a follower. It means a student. That's really all it means. Nothing fancy there. The, the work of discipling is very important. It's kind of like mentorship. It's kind of like coaching but in a more robust and spiritual way. So Paul again addresses this uh, in the letter to the Ephesians, where he tells them that the Lord gave various ministries and various spiritual gifts and positions. And he says, some of which include, for example, evangelists and shepherds and teachers. Why? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, meaning the, the, the gathered people of the church, until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, comma, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know how, you, have you ever, who here has ever posed for a picture beside one of the life-size cardboard figures of somebody famous or something? You know, and so there's this cardboard figure where you look really like, wow, so that's kind of what they would look like almost in person. You know, and I like to get a picture with that person, right? And so here in this passage, Paul is saying that the church's job through discipleship is to bring Christians up to maturity, and he uses this phrase, to mature manhood. In the Greek, it's literally andra teleon. Andra is the word for man. To teleon means complete or mature, to mature manhood, to being a complete person. And it's, notice he says, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so we start out as Christians, baby Christians, and we are to grow to the point where if Christ was standing here, so to speak, we would be at the fullness of stature with him, meaning Christ-like, being like Jesus in the way we live, in the way we think, in the way we talk, to be spiritually mature like him. That is the point of the ministry of the church. And to, to whatever extent it can be possible, the ministry of chapels, that which are obviously kind of churches, in a sense, out uh, on the edges, right? Where we're put in these locations to serve our country. And so you see Paul's talking about this. So what is baptism? It's a visible public sign of identifying with Christ. It's your way of publicly visibly showing, you're saying, I am a Christian, and I have assurance that I am, and I want everyone to know this, primarily fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, the family of God. 
Obviously, others who aren't Christians can, can know and even come and watch out of support and out of love. They can do that and just see it. But, but at first rank, it is for the fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's your way of saying, I am one of you, and I identify publicly and openly that I am going to be a follower of Christ, a disciple of Christ. I belong to him. That's what baptism does. And it's symbolic, of course. The whole idea of going down into the water and coming up. You see the pattern of that over and over again in the Bible. And this is why, we, this is why I had the reading of Romans 6. We, when, when Christ died, we died with him and we're buried. And when Christ arose, if you're a Christian spiritually, you rose to new life with him. And that's why the Bible calls Christians those who have new life. They have been born again. They have new life in them. And hence Nicodemus telling Jesus, how can I go back to my mother's womb and be born a second time? And Jesus says, no, we're not talking about physical, we're talking spiritually. And spiritually means really. Sometimes people think of spirituality as this thing, you, it's kind of like just a belief only. When you see people's lives really change, you can see that it's real. Spirituality is not a fake thing, and it's not just a, a mere thought in the head. Because the Bible describes changed people. I've experienced the changes, and I continue to experience them. I know many of you in this room have experienced the changes. It's a real thing. It's a real spiritual change that happens. And so baptism is just that. And so, of course, the book of Acts is replete with examples of this activity of where the Lord brings someone to salvation and then the person is baptized. And we see, for example, in, in Acts chapter 8, and we see it in Acts chapter 9. In Acts 8, Philip is uh, out doing just what the Lord said. He's gone out and he's looking to make disciples and he's ready to baptize them and disciple them. And here he is traveling along and there is this chariot with an Ethiopian man in it. He was a court official. He was a court official for the queen of the Ethiopians, whose name was Candace. I'm reading from Acts 6. And this Ethiopian man was in charge of all of her treasures as the queen of Ethiopia. And he came to Jerusalem to worship. And then he was returning, and he was on the road in his chariot, and he's reading a copy, a scroll. There was, of course, no Bible like this complete. He's reading a scroll of Isaiah. He's probably reading it line by line in the chariot on his way in service to Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. And it says in chapter 8, verse 29, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And Philip ran to him, and Philip heard the Ethiopian man, reading Isaiah the prophet, and asked, do you understand what you are reading? Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, the Ethiopian eunuch says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And so the passage given there of scripture talks about like a sheep he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shearer is silent he opens not his mouth. Now that is a quote from Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the strongest passage in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah Jesus Christ. It's so clear. It's unmistakable. In fact it was my go-to chapter when I as a hospice chaplain used to go and visit my Jewish patients. And when I found out that the patient was Jewish and I went to visit them, I would take my copy of the Old Testament with me and I would say, would you like for me to read to you from the Torah, from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament, which for them would be their scriptures. And sometimes they would say yes. And if they did, I would go right to Isaiah 53 and I would read it to them. And I would say, who do you think this is? Many of them said, I really don't know. Some said, well, the rabbis have told us it's about the Messiah. Some would say more clearly, oh, that's definitely a reference to the Messiah. There was my opportunity 
as far as they would allow for me to begin to talk about Christ being the Messiah. But so here we are in this passage, and so he's reading about this lamb, right? And of course, what does John the Baptist say about Jesus as soon as Jesus comes on the scene? Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And even in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it, ta- it talks about Jesus being the Lamb constantly. The Lamb, the Lamb. And that's because Jesus is the embodiment and the fulfillment of the Old Testament sacrifice of the Lamb in, on the altar. What that was was a picture of what was to come, Jesus. And then when he did come, he fulfilled that by dying on the cross and shedding his blood to be a sacrifice for sinners like us. And so, of course, as the Ethiopian is reading this, Philip explains it. And it says here in verse 33, "In In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And so the Ethiopian man gets saved. He gets converted. He becomes a Christian. And that's why we see in verse 31, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the uh, eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch, he said, See, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. That's part of the Great Commission. That's the third thing. Go into all the world. Make disciples, baptizing them. And of course, the fourth one is teaching. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And all all that Jesus has commanded is not just the Gospels where we see him talking. If you have a red letter Bible, that's all the red letters you see. That's him talking. Jesus referred to the entire Old Testament as Scripture, as the Word of God. And Jesus commissioned his apostles who wrote our, the rest of our New Testament from Acts all the way to Revelation. He commissioned them to speak for him, to represent him, and to establish the church. This is why we can go from Genesis to Revelation, the entire scripture. Jesus affirms it all. So when we read here, to observe all that I've commanded, he's commanding not only what he himself said, he's commanding that everything he says is scripture also be followed, which is our entire Bible. And so, what is the Lord looking for? He is looking for people who will not only surrender to him and be saved and be baptized and become a disciple and a follower and be taught and grow into maturity as a Christian, he's looking for people who will also go out and do the same thing. He's looking for those to replicate, to go out and do that. And isn't it beautiful that God has gifted each Christian in some aspect of these four things? There are some Christians who have a desire and a drive to go. And they will go to mission fields. They will go around the world. They will go out to the ethnos, the ethnicities of the world. And there are some that when the person gets saved, they begin to disciple them, to help them understand the faith, get them started. And then there are pastors and elders who will baptize them at a local church or chapel. And then there are those that are gifted with the sense of teaching and doctrine, and they will begin to teach and instruct the the Christian in the truth of God's word. And so God has a perfect plan, and he has laid out for us all the ways in which a person can reach maturity. And he's gifted and talented all Christians to be able to to play some part in these four commands. What about you? You know, the Bible refers to Christians as, uh, the Greek word is doulos. Doulos means a servant or a slave. 
an absolute, in an absolute sense, not a part-timer, but a complete, fully given over servant or slave to God. And that's what the Lord is looking for. He's looking for someone who's totally dedicated. And by that, I don't mean you become a pastor or a minister or a missionary necessarily. No, no. Just in whatever sphere of life and work you have, in whatever your vocation or calling is, that plus your personal life, your family life, your social life, in every way, your financial life, your moral life, you're completely at his service to live according to his ways in your life. That's what God is looking for. And that's why he does indeed receive all glory and honor. And to wrap things up, uh, I turn to a passage in, in Revelation 5 where you can again see the, the awe. Remember at the beginning, those disciples, they fell, the, the apostles really, they fell down and they just worshipped the Lord when they saw him just before he gave that great commission. And so in, in Revelation 5, we get a glimpse into heaven, a glimpse into the spiritual world, the disembodied world. These are the spirits of all believers as well as in the presence of God. And it says here in Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. And then we see down in verse 12, another loud voice cries out toward, in reference to Jesus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. So, isn't it interesting that while Christ in his final moments on earth after his death and resurrection, he encounters his twelve. And when they saw him, But then, at the end of earth time, when the Lord looks, so to speak, at his watch and says, time is up. I'm coming back. And I am going to judge the world. Everyone. And I'm going to establish and renew, rejuvenate heaven and earth. And we just saw a glimpse of what kind of thing will be going on. They will, everyone, both in heaven and on earth, everything, everyone, will be giving glory and honor and majesty and power, attributing it to God. You, you, it belongs all to you. You are worthy of this. This is who you are. You deserve all this. I humbly acknowledge this is who you are. It's not me. It's you. And I am so blessed to be able to say it and to be in your presence and to know you and to be reconciled to you. Oh, that will be the most glorious and humbling moment for any Christian will be that moment. But the beautiful thing is you can taste it now while you're still here on earth. While we're all still here, we can get glimpses and tastes of it. The fullness will come later, but we can get some of it now. And so, baptism is just a picture of a person who says, I have died to my old self of sin, and I have been raised up 
in a new life, a changed person, living, alive for Jesus, and I want to live for him. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful to get a glimpse of you and to have just a sense, a touch, a little look of who you are. Thank you, Lord, for revealing yourself to us, not only in your own creation, nature. Thank you for revealing yourself by Jesus coming in the flesh, being God on earth for us, going to the cross, paying for sins like ours, rising again in victory, going into glory where he is adored and worshipped. But we here are left to do your work, to go, to make disciples, to baptize, to teach. Help us, Lord, to be inspired to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So from this point, uh, we'll release Brother Austin, and I will step out as well to prepare, and we'll, we'll come up and hop in the baptistry. And then I invite, uh, once we get up there, I invite all of you to come up, and you can just stand here on the platform and make a circle around, so you can, because you can't see it from there. So just come on up, and if you, I invite you to, uh, if you want to take a picture or film it, uh, that you can maybe give to, uh, to uh, some of us afterwards. I appreciate that. So uh, we'll have some music playing um, while we change, and then when we come up, we'll bring you forward, okay?
again. So uh, before I get have the privilege of being baptized to give my testimony, um, on December 29th, 2019, to spare a lot of details, I uh, was struggling with deciding if I wanted to be here anymore. And um, before I decided that it was I was going <laughs> to leave, I needed to figure out if uh, God was real. And so I bought a Bible off of Amazon and I started reading it through. And as I was reading it through a few weeks later, I found a friend and we ended up going to a church. And I had no idea what church I was in. But the more that I read the scriptures, the more that I realized that this Jesus guy that they were talking about wasn't really what the scriptures were saying. And uh, so for about six months, I was struggling with trying to figure out why Jesus was so important and why nobody was talking about him until I got here. And uh, in the chapel, everybody was asking me what my background is. And the answer that I gave everybody is, I don't know. i just trying to follow the Bible. And uh, I ended up coming into contact with Cody, and he told me to watch American Gospel. And when I watched American Gospel, that was the first time I'd ever really heard the gospel, period. And this whole time of six months of me trying to figure out who Christ is, American Gospel unraveled so much that it was, I watched the movie two hour long, I watched it 12 times in a week. Because I, I needed to know who Christ was. And then after that moment, it was now that I knew who Christ is, was trying to get others to see who Christ is. But it was finally understanding that the reason why Christ is so important is because God is so holy that apart from him, I have no place and I deserve just condemnation in hell because of the treason and trespasses of my sins. And Christ died on a cross for my sins so I could be redeemed and reconciled to God. And now it's been my resolution in life to make find others who had the same struggles that I had for six months so that they know who Christ is so they don't go through the same struggles I had for six months of trying to figure out who this guy is and why he's so important and why nobody talks about him so that's that's it of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and based on your own desire to follow him through this ordinance, to die to self and to live and walk in newness of life in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Thank you all for, uh, for being here to support him and see what God is doing in his life. And uh, Austin, like I said in my sermon, Austin will tell you it's real. He's experiencing it day by day. He's a changed man, and I've, I've been able to watch, been able to have seen the change in his life, and the Lord is doing a great work in him. And I call you to do the same thing, if you have not. Amen. So let's go back to our seat, and we're going to have closing song, and then I'll come out and give the uh, benediction. Where the Spirit 